members of the LGBTQ community. It is my honor to present the professor of Pride Academy, Matt Haslam. Good evening. Today is National Coming Out Day, which is a day to celebrate our love and our gender. It is a day our community set aside to help others who are not yet out of the closet. We spend this holiday guiding others with our advice, the stories of our personal journeys, and our messages of hope. But today, we must also remember that helping someone come out of the closet does not mean they have to tell their family members or their friends. As I have said many times before, those steps can take time, and it is perfectly acceptable to take that time. More importantly, today is about helping others in our community by first helping them admit it to themselves. Because in order for others to accept us for who we are and who we love, in order for us to be happy, we must first accept ourselves. But as we stand here today, there are many evils our community faces worldwide. After so many years hearing the same lies over and over, we get accustomed to dealing with these evils, but the sad reality is that evil still exists. And I would argue our adversaries know that we will overcome these challenges because we have learned not to listen to their blatant lies. I would argue their intention is now aimed at those in our community who are still closeted with the intent of making them fear coming out to anyone including themselves. So in these trying times, it is important that we remember the great words from Martin Luther King Jr., who once said, we must accept finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. And this hope is why we have chosen today to address the state of our union. Infinite hope is the reason why we in the LGBTQ community know that the state of our union is stronger than it has ever been before. This year, the whole world had an opportunity to put their hatred of our community and their hatred of other minorities aside. That opportunity came in the tragic form of one of the worst global pandemics in history. The coronavirus put all of us humans on the same level playing field. As horrific as these past few months have been, for once in our lives, our age, gender, sexuality, religion, or color of skin didn't matter. And while this pandemic is still going on, I wish we could say that the world put its bigotry aside to fight a common enemy, but it failed to do so. Preliminary tracing shows that COVID-19 disproportionately affected the LGBTQ, as well as black and Hispanic minority groups. Not because the coronavirus itself targeted us, but because our governments, specifically left our communities in the path of destruction. In fact, over 40% of LGBTQ employees work in industries where they face more exposure to COVID infection and economic insecurity. In the hardest hit country of the United States, top officials in the White House were blaming the coronavirus on gay people, saying that it is God's punishment for homosexuality. When a true American hero and LGBTQ activist lawyer Richard Weber Jr. passed away from the coronavirus, the religious news outlet True News chose to celebrate his death live on air. And when amazing leaders like Dr. Rachel Levine were leading Pennsylvania's Department of Health and saving countless lives, others, including top White House officials, chose to attack her for being transgender instead of critiquing her life-saving policies. But plenty of truly remarkable doctors and scientists, including LGBTQ doctors like Dr. Rachel Levine, are working around the clock to help save as many lives as possible. And for that reason, we must not lose infinite hope. Please join me in a brief moment of silence for all of the LGBTQ members lost to the coronavirus and all of our community members still fighting for every breath. A moment ago, I told you there was evil working against our community, but sometimes that evil is impossible to ignore. 
Homophobia and transphobia are caused by a severe lack of education and false narratives. These acts of bigotry come in many forms, anywhere from supporting anti-LGBTQ elected officials to violence and murder. In fact, just this past August in Los Angeles, California, three transgender women were attacked by a man who was armed with a crowbar and a glass bottle. These items were used to savagely beat the three women to the ground and causing one of them to black out. As he attacked the three women, he called out transphobic slurs and made it known that he was attacking them solely because they are transgender. While this attack was no doubt evil, the worst was yet to come. Every single person who watched in person as this event unfolded on the streets of Los Angeles made the conscious decision to either call out transphobic slurs in support of the attacker or pull out their phones and live stream the attack to social media while calling out transphobic slurs themselves. No one stepped in to help the three women and no one made any attempts to stop the man from beating them to the ground. In fact, the attacker and the bystanders all bragged about the attack on social media over the coming days. The good news was that one of the three victims is a YouTuber named Eden the Doll, with just under 300,000 subscribers and over 25 million views. So when she took the story to her YouTube channel, the public outcry to hold the attackers accountable was deafening. Soon the police arrested the suspect and he will now have his day in court. But if this story sounds familiar, it's because it happens far too often. Not only do victims and their families regularly have to petition and ask for public outcry in order for their attackers to be held accountable for their actions, but the attacks themselves are somewhat of a regular occurrence. And if you haven't heard of this story specifically, or if you feel somewhat numb at this point after hearing so many stories like it, you're not alone. Even for activists and researchers like myself, we've grown numb to stories like this one. Just this year alone, the Human Rights Campaign estimates there have been at least 27 transgender and gender nonconforming individuals fatally shot or killed in the United States alone. That number currently equals the 2019 records of 27 trans and gender nonconforming people murdered. But 2020 is far from over. Again, I feel the need to remind you that those numbers are merely in the United States alone, which is not great on LGBTQ rights, but sadly ahead of most countries. In fact, being homosexual was decriminalized in the United States in 2003. I know this feels like one of those unalienable rights we were promised in the Declaration of Independence, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it feels like one of those basic human rights the LGBTQ should have been granted on day one of our country back in 1776. Even, in our, even our first president, George Washington, was a gay rights supporter, and his chief of staff was a gay man. But our rights to love but our right to love was only granted 17 years ago. This means for those in my generation and older, we still vividly remember a time when being able to love was against the law in our country. And since being gay is scientifically proven to not be a choice, we were forced to hide our own DNA from the world, which is impossible. I write a lot about my uncle Jeffrey Blake. He was born in 1946 and passed away a few months before I was born in 1992. But throughout my childhood, my grandmother would sit and tell me countless stories about his life. She always told me about the striking similarities between us, because we both hid the fact that we were gay throughout our childhood. And I talk about him a lot, because it reminds me of how lucky I am to live in the era and the country I do. The sad reality is that we know how difficult it is to hide something which is sewn into our DNA long before we are born. And while it is finally legal to love in our country, we know that we are lucky for living here. Still to this day in 2020, there are 70 countries worldwide which criminalize homosexuality. Worse yet, in 12 of those countries, including Saudi Arabia, Sudan, United Arab Emirates, Nigeria, and others. Being LGBTQ is punishable by death. 
at the Pennsylvania Equality Project where I volunteer my time. We have this saying which goes, none are equal until all are equal. So when there are countries which we cannot visit on business trips or vacations solely because they would kill us for being LGBTQ, that is not what equality looks like. But that's aside from the LGBTQ who live in those countries and face those injustices if they are unable to hide who they are and who they love from everyone all of their lives. While the rest of the world doesn't criminalize being LGBTQ, still to this day, there are only 29 countries worldwide where same-sex marriage is allowed. Seven of these, including here in the United States, have only passed marriage equality thanks to high court decisions, not through legislation passed through their government officials. While our love and gender might be legally allowed in most of the 195 countries in the world, the basic human right to marry whomever you choose is only allowed in about 15% of them. If we look at some of the more progressive countries, such as Germany, being LGBTQ is perfectly allowed. LGBTQ members are allowed to serve openly in the military. Conversion therapy was completely banned from the country just this past year alone, so congratulations. Gay people are allowed to donate blood, and 88% of the country's population supports the LGBTQ community. But even in Germany, hate crimes against the LGBTQ have risen every year since 2014, which is partly why the government officials there are admitting and desperately trying to do even more to help our community members living there. However, Germany is far from alone. In the United Kingdom, 20% of LGBTQ people and 40% of transgender individuals have been a victim of a hate crime in the last 12 months. And worse yet, 80% of the hate crimes in the country have gone unreported, mostly due to younger individuals being reluctant to go to the police. In the United States, the FBI openly admits that a majority of hate crimes are not reported to any higher office than your local police station because there is a severe lack of education most police and district attorneys receive on how to deal with anti-LGBTQ hate crimes. And that's not even mentioning the fact that only 24 of the 50 states in America have hate crime laws covering LGBTQ people. Where I live in Pennsylvania, we are not one of these 24. But looking at FBI data, hate crimes against LGBTQ people were generally on the decline from 2008 to 2014. Since 2014, anti-LGBTQ hate crimes have been on the severe rise year after year. In Brazil, they elected an extremely homophobic president, while simultaneously, its Supreme Court made homophobia and transphobia a criminal offense. Our community has suffered through far too many years of people being allowed to commit heinous acts against us. So we applaud Brazil's Supreme Court, but their president is now the main person breaking that law. For this reason, it sends a mixed message to Brazilians, and it begs the question of whether or not their president should face criminal prosecution. In Poland, one-third of the country is already covered by LGBTQ-free zones, where being LGBTQ is against the law. But the current president of Poland just signed something called the Family Card on June 10th of this year, making it against the law to acknowledge that LGBTQ people exist and against the law for teachers or therapists to tell kids that it's normal to be LGBTQ. So to all Polish people watching, please know that it is completely normal to be LGBTQ. No, you are not alone, and we hold infinite hope for our community members living there. Globally, we must face these challenges head on. We must fight onward for the 60% of LGBTQ people worldwide who are scared of holding hands in public, Due to, due to the threat of harassment and attack. Like James Baldwin once said, we know not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Just look at the milestone we crossed this year. 2020 marks the 30th anniversary since homosexuality was declassified as a disease internationally. In the United States, the American Psychiatric Association declassified it as a disease in 1973. Again, you might assume this was a basic human right granted to LGBTQ people centuries ago, 
but in reality, it was only given to us a few decades ago. Years ago, when my uncle was still alive, LGBTQ people had to fear not only being sent to prison, but far worse being sent to an insane asylum, just because of who they are and who they love. These were unwarranted classifications put on our community, with no evidence to support them. Our community members were put next to people with severe mental illness, and society said very little about it. But our community members started standing up in New York in 1964 and at Stonewall in 1969, demanding change. And by 1973, that classification was finally buried in history. While it is now 30 to 50 years later, the harmful effects of that classification have still not gone away. LGBTQ people are still regularly called mentally ill, with transgender and non-binary individuals having these slurs thrown at them far more often than homosexuals. Sadly, the worst example of these effects carrying over into the present day are in our education system. Homophobia and transphobia are things our children learn from their parents and their teachers. In many countries, including the United States, schools are not required, and in some cases they are banned from talking about LGBTQ people at all, let alone teaching their students how normal it is to be a member of our community. Students don't get to learn about LGBTQ history, literature, science, and so on. This has proven to cause cisgender and straight students to grow up, le to grow up learning that LGBTQ people are not normal because we are not spoken about at all. And this is one of the leading causes why the words gay, faggot, and tranny are regularly used by bullies, when in truth, these words should be banned from being used in such regards. There is legislation called the Safe Schools Improvement Act, which would require schools receiving federal funding to implement policies to ban bullying, including on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. It also requires schools to report any anti-LGBTQ bullying to the U.S. Department of Education. That bill, that bill is currently sitting in the U.S. House of Representatives, and we call upon our elected officials to pass it immediately. Worse yet, for the 10% of any classroom anywhere in the world who will later in life realize and classify themselves as LGBTQ, we are not taught anything about LGBTQ health or sexual education. In some countries, like Poland, it is now against the law for teachers to speak about gay or transgender health. But even in more progressive countries, like America, our community has to learn health and sexual education online from classrooms like our Pride Academy here at Powered by Rainbows. Our school systems know the harmful effects they are causing. 48% of LGBTQ youth and more than 60% of transgender youth reported engaging in self-harm in the past year alone. Surely a portion of this is caused by other classmates who bully LGBTQ members. But to be fair, those students were never taught how to accept LGBTQ classmates. So we cannot entirely blame these horrifying statistics on other students. Most of that blame traces back to the adults and teachers. Even now, 60% of LGBTQ youth report that someone tried convincing them to change their sexual orientation or gender identity in the past year alone. And when students see their teachers and adults trying to change LGBTQ classmates' sexuality or gender identity, they incorrectly learn from that example. Some schools have started Gender Sexuality Alliance Clubs, otherwise known as GSA Clubs. These can teach students how normal they are for being LGBTQ and can provide quality education which students cannot learn in the normal classroom. For these materials and this education, schools turn to organizations such as PFLAG, GLSEN, It Gets Better, The Trevor Project, and Powered by Rainbows. But these are elective, after-school programs, which hateful parents might not want their children included in, which proves that this education needs to be mandatory during normal school hours. But for the LGBTQ children of the world, Hatred at school and a severe lack of proper education are the least of their worries. 86% of LGBTQ youth worldwide say that recent politics in the United States have negatively impacted their, will, their well-being. Crisis intervention and suicide prevention hotlines for LGBTQ youth 
report a sudden spike in the number of calls and cries for help every time Donald Trump signed one of his 170 anti-LGBTQ policies since taking office just four years ago. So our kids are paying attention to the news and they feel the effects at home. Even if they weren't paying attention, coming out to parents or family members can be extremely dangerous for some children. This is why we joined the Trevor Project and other major organizations in suggesting LGBTQ youth test the waters first to see if you will be accepted. And we suggest only coming out to people who you are certain will support you. This is because somehow in countries like the United States, parents are legally allowed to kick their children out of their home before the child legally becomes an adult and turns 18. You might assume this would be against the law because it is against the law and it's called child abandonment. But if your child comes out as LGBTQ, your freedom of religion makes you somehow exempt from this law and exempt from your parenting duties. In fact, 50% of transgender and non-binary youth report being kicked out of their home after coming out. Staying in the United States for just a moment, our country offers its residents with freedom, freedom of religion, meaning LGBTQ people are allowed to believe in any religion they choose without the fear of persecution. We are also a country which is very proud of our liberty for all, yet in our country, not everyone is free. 10% of LGBTQ children reported receiving some form of conversion therapy in the past year alone. Conversion therapy is the practice of trying to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. More often than not, conversion therapy is a camp parents send their children to. Sometimes this so-called therapy could also be more locally based or even home based practices. Of course, changing someone's LGBTQ status is impossible, so it has never once in the history of mankind accomplished its goal. But if that doesn't but that doesn't stop religious leaders from electrocuting, torturing, and chemically castrating children to this day. In fact, if a child undergoes any form of conversion therapy, it more than doubles the likelihood of a suicide attempt for that child. Yet in many countries, including America, conversion therapy is still legally allowed in many states. Worse yet, one of the largest conversion therapy organizations in the country is called Focus on the Family, founded by James Dobson. In June of 2017, Vice President Mike Pence gave an award to Dobson in honor of his work for pushing LGBTQ kids to suicide. But the, but the leading cause of parents forcing their children to attend what many call suicide camps is because of religious reasons, claiming incorrectly that being gay or transgender are sins. Of course, we in the LGBTQ know this is yet another blatant lie because no major religion in the world even mentions homosexuality in their scripture, let alone it being a sin. And that's putting aside the fact that even if it were a sin to be gay or transgender, as American citizens, we have the right to choose our own religion without being persecuted by other religions. In countries like China, with the world's highest population, homosexuality has been legal since 1997, but conversion therapy is actively promoted nationwide, and residents there are not allowed to express homosexual love in any online video or, or audio content. Once a child grows up to be an adult and starts looking for a job, things do get slightly better though. Just this past year in the United States, the majorly conservative Supreme Court ruled in favor of LGBTQ rights, making it against the law for employers to fire their workers for being LGBTQ. This added the United States to the growing list of 77 countries worldwide, which prohibit discrimination in employment based on someone's sexual orientation. This list includes Australia, France, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Mexico. But even in some of those countries like Canada, which we assume are more progressive than the, than the United States when it comes to LGBTQ rights, they only outlawed workplace discrimination to LGBTQ people in June of 2017. And while all of this is fantastic news for our community, not being fired for being gay or transgender is a very low bar of equality. 
especially when you consider 22% of LGBTQ Americans have not been paid equally or promoted at the same rate as their peers. Gay and bisexual men earn 10 to 32% less than their straight counterparts. Lesbian and bisexual women earn 21% less than straight men do. If you're a transgender woman, chances are you will earn about two thirds of what your cisgender counterparts do. However, if you are a transgender male, you are more likely to receive a wage advantage. In other countries like Germany, studies show that gay men earn less than straight men do. However, gay men are much more educated compared to straight men in Germany. And in Australia, gay men earn 13% less than, straight, their, than their straight counterparts. However, Australian lesbians earn about 13% more than straight women do. But even though there is a massive pay gap between LGBTQ and our straight and cisgender counterparts in the workforce, we have infinite hope. Right now, there is a bill which has passed the United States House of Representatives called the Paycheck Fairness Act, which would require every employer to pay their LGBTQ workers, as well as other minorities, equally for the same positions. Sadly, just like the Equality Act, it is currently being held up in the Senate by one person, even though it has enough votes to pass if it was allowed to go to, to a vote on the Senate floor. In America, if one person doesn't agree with a piece of federal or state legislation, as long as that person is the majority leader, they don't have to bring it to the floor for a vote, even if a majority of representatives or senators have co-sponsored and guaranteed they would vote in favor of it. So as of today, numerous major pieces of legislation for our community are being held up because of one man not believing LGBTQ people deserve the same rights under the Constitution. And that man's name is Mitch McConnell. Because this pay gap does exist currently in many countries around the world, it forces us to talk about the next leading problem our community faces, which is homelessness. If we simply looked at LGBTQ youth, which are classified as any community member living under the age of 18, they are 120% more likely to experience homelessness compared to straight and cisgender youth of their same age. Worldwide studies show that only 19% of child homelessness is caused by their family being below the poverty line and not being able to afford housing. However, 78% of gay youth homelessness and 84% of transgender youth homelessness is caused by their families forcing them out of their homes and forcing them to run away after coming out. But this problem is not something which is limited to our youth. 71% of homeless LGBTQ people experience lifetime homelessness as an adult. Being gay, bisexual, or pan makes you twice as likely to experience lifetime homelessness compared to straight people. And among LGBTQ adults, African Americans reported significantly higher rates of recent housing instability. So the question becomes, have our elected officials taken any actions to protect our community from homelessness? In America, our elected officials have done the exact opposite. The man in charge of homeless shelters in the United States is a man named Ben Carson, who has proposed rules to allow homeless shelters to deny transgender people from being housed in emergency shelters. And in his public statements, he's called trans women quote, big hairy men who try to infiltrate women's shelters. Sadly, someone gave that same man a license to be a brain surgeon, even though it's disgusting to find out how little he knows about science. To be fair, this past June, he announced a modification to the rule that now allows individual housing service providers to decide whether or not they want to discriminate. But this new rule now allows discrimination against all LGBTQ people, not just transgender individuals, and it forces the federal government to still provide the same federal funding no matter if an individual shelter discriminates or not. In other words, a homeless shelter could deny LGBTQ people from being housed based solely on their LGBTQ status. 
Therefore, the homeless shelter provides less services, yet it still would receive the same federal funding. Our rights to fair housing and homeless shelters are far from the only rights the Trump administration has come after these past few years. We could list off all 170 anti-LGBTQ policies Mr. Trump has passed, but quite possibly one of the worst was on June 12th of this year, the four-year anniversary of the Pulse nightclub shooting, which was the worst terroristic attack against LGBTQ people in the United States history. On that day, Trump officially signed a policy which would allow medical providers to discriminate against transgender people. Luckily, a number of LGBTQ groups challenged the policy in court, and more than two months later, the federal court ruled that Trump's policy was illegal. But LGBTQ healthcare protections are far from out of the woods under his administration. Countries such as Germany, France, and the United Kingdom give us infinite hope, though. In the UK, their National Health Service has a detailed action plan of how they will improve their national system over the coming years to further assist their LGBTQ community. And in Germany and France, they have vowed to make similar improvements. But still in other countries, such as Italy, it's no surprise they discriminate against LGBTQ people when it comes to healthcare, because Italy is known as one of the worst countries in Western Europe for gay rights. On the subject of healthcare, there is quite possibly no greater topic of discussion than tobacco use. LGBTQ people smoke at rates of two and a half times higher than straight adults. 20.6% of lesbian and gay adults and 35.5% of transgender adults smoke cigarettes compared to just 14.9% of straight adults. Bisexual women are up to three and a half times more likely to smoke, and worse yet, 36% of LGBTQ smokers report they smoke menthol cigarettes, which are easier to use and harder to quit. But why do LGBTQ people smoke at higher rates compared to our straight and cisgender counterparts? It's because since 1991, tobacco companies have been specifically targeting the LGBTQ community. And still, 30 years later, and according to our extensive research, there are no federal protections preventing tobacco companies from targeting our community in any country around the world. And we couldn't find a single federal lawsuit or class action against these tobacco companies for their targeted advertising. For this reason, our community is now dealing with the harmful effects of tobacco use, including cancer. When it comes to healthcare though, tobacco use is only one of the many issues we must address in the coming years. Another issue is how we take care of our elderly in the LGBTQ community. When most people get to a certain age, they move into assisted living centers, nursing homes, or other elderly care facilities. While federal courts are increasingly protecting LGBTQ people and defining LGBTQ discrimination under sex discrimination, which is luckily illegal in the United States, that doesn't apply to many situations. First off, elderly care facilities which receive federal funding fall under the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And as we've mentioned before, their secretary, Ben Carson, allows individual facilities to choose whether or not they want to discriminate. Facilities which don't receive federal funding always had the right to discriminate against our community since they are privately funded. But even if an elderly member of our community is allowed in an elderly care facility and provided fair housing, studies show that they are far more likely to face worse discrimination inside of that care facility. Nearly half of elderly LGBTQ people had either been abused or witnessed abuse. Our elderly members are regularly separated from their same-sex partners, forced to share a room with a homophobic or transphobic person on purpose, and regularly verbally and physically harassed by staff members. Worst of all, staff members in care facilities oftentimes refuse to accept medical power of attorney from LGBTQ elderly and refuse to use an individual's preferred name or pronoun. Younger generations will certainly see the, see the benefits of national marriage equality in 29 countries worldwide, which allow same-sex marriage. But we sometimes forget 
that our elderly never had marriage equality. For many elderly members of our community, they are still dealing with the harmful effects of this, including higher rates of isolation by not having a spouse or children like many of their neighbors in these care facilities have. Many transgender people go back into the closet before going to an elderly care facility, and only 50% of seniors in our community said they would be comfortable being out of the closet in a care home. Even AARP backs up these studies with their own. They report that LGBTQ seniors are at a higher risk of mental health issues, disabilities, and have higher rates of tobacco and excessive alcohol use. For as many rights as we have in the homosexual and queer community, many times our transgender community members are far behind us when it comes to equal rights. In some Eastern countries, transgender people are more widely accepted compared to gay individuals. But this past year, someone made a huge impact on my life, and I want to quickly share her insightful message. She is a transgender woman who organized the first ever Pottsville LGBTQ Pride Day in June of this year. That entire broadcast is one you can watch here on our channel. But before she invited me to the microphone to speak that day, she shared with me something I rarely think about. As a gay man, I wear rainbow clothing all the time and host a show like this one. But if I simply took my rainbows off, I could hide the fact that I was gay at least for a little while. Transgender people don't have that option. When they start matching their gender expression with their gender identity, as they should be able to do, they do so by wearing the appropriate clothing, using the appropriate restrooms, and so on. Sadly, transgender and non-binary individuals are much more prone to verbal harassment and physical attacks simply because it's not just a rainbow shirt they can choose not to wear that day. In fact, 61% of transgender and non-binary youth report being prevented or discouraged from using the, a bathroom which corresponds to the gender they identify as. But here in the United States, we have infinite hope. Years ago, the U.S. Department of Defense put restrictions on all schools, both public and private. These required schools to allow trans students to use the appropriate restrooms, but this requirement was reversed by Donald Trump in February of 2017. Lawsuits have since prevailed in our community's favor, but those cases are many times settled out of court, meaning there is no official ruling for the school to follow in the future. For instance, after Donald Trump did that in 2017, in Minersville, Pennsylvania, the school district didn't allow a trans student to use the appropriate bathroom just this past year. The family filed a lawsuit and the school later settled that case out of court for a few hundred thousand dollars. The voters later complained about how much it cost in taxpayer dollars, but no one mentioned the discrimination. Sadly, because no official court decision was made, the school has no official ruling to follow in the future. This means they can technically continue discriminating without any fears other than further settlements. These issues might seem monumental, but as the famous gay activist Thomas Lloyd once said, quote, it is easier to change a society than to change your own identity, and it does much less damage that way. So these are all problems we can face head on, and these are all hurdles we can pass given enough momentum and help from our allies. All of these issues are external challenges we face from the society around us. However, many times we forget that we are not perfect ourselves. Our community faces internal problems as well. The first of these is loneliness and the gay hookup culture. Studies show that more than 70% of gay men use a gay dating app such on their smartphone, such as Recon, Adam for Adam, Scruff, Surge, or my personal favorites, and two of the most popular, Grinder and Howler. Researchers found that gay men spend an average of 90 minutes per day on these applications, but they are not looking for love or a long-term relationship. They are looking for a one-night stand. From an early age, gay men are not taught how their love or our relationships will work in classrooms or from their parents. So when a gay teenager cannot learn these things in their classroom, they turn to online resources. 
and while some resources like ours exist for them, many times it is easier to find more mature websites, and the research is a lot more fun that way. Throughout your childhood as a gay person, you're taught one simple thing. When you can't find love, sex is the easiest substitute. So when you grow up and start dating, finding a hookup becomes the easiest substitute. This is especially true since researchers also found that applications like Grindr are carefully designed to make you feel bad about yourself and your body image. They do so while simultaneously pushing advertiser products and services as well as their own subscription services to make you feel better about yourself. And this past year, online dating apps have become far more valuable of an industry thanks to the pandemic. The second internal challenge we face is accepting our bisexual community. Those who identify themselves as bisexual slightly outnumber the amount of people who are gay and lesbian combined. However, bisexual youth and adults experience higher rates of discrimination, harassment, and anxiety. In fact, recent reports found that bisexual people face what we call double discrimination from both straight and gay people. When a bisexual person is coming out, they might trust their gay or lesbian friends and might assume they would get immediate support from them. But the gay community regularly believes that bisexual people are just in the process of coming out as gay, but are too afraid to say it entirely. And for this reason, bisexual children and adults are less likely to come out to anyone because they fear this double discrimination. But our need to accept our own community members is not limited to bisexuals, it's everyone. This past year, researchers have found that 84% of gay men felt intense pressure to not just have a good looking body, but the best looking body out of everyone they know. Many profiles on dating applications nowadays use some key phrases such as no fats, no femmies, gym fit only, or the most common, I work out and you should too. In fact, when you sign up for a gay dating app like Grindr, they publish your weight, your body type, and more. This is aside from the fact that a majority of men use faceless profile pictures on these apps and show off their chest or skinny bodies to impress potential partners scrolling by. Your entire job on these apps becomes to impress the next guy scrolling past your photo. Impress them enough with a sexy photo and they click on your profile. But the rest of your statistics have to impress them enough to tap or message you. So being on a dating app becomes more like trying to choose a character in a video game. And this again contributes to the, contributes to the depression and anxiety the apps themselves cause and try to sell you services to counteract. This problem on dating apps carries over into real life situations with far too many LGBTQ people body shaming each other at in-person events or at LGBTQ restaurants and bars. Last but not least, one of the most prevalent internal challenges we face inside of our own community is driving. Since this trend is so new in our community, many researchers, including our team, are still trying to collect the ample data needed to make firm conclusions of the scope of the challenge and make recommendations on potential solutions. But what we know at the moment is that a sizable percentage of gay men do not own a vehicle or have a license to drive. Some do so because of medical reasons or easy access to public transportation where they live, but some never felt the need to drive at all. I would like to note here that someone not having a license or a car is not the biggest problem in our community. And for some people in our community, it's not a problem at all. As we mentioned a moment ago, many gay men are simply trying to find hookups and thus driving isn't as much of a challenge to overcome. But while individual members of our community believe dating someone without a license is perfectly fine, as researchers and activists, we must look at the society and take notice of the major trends. And currently one of the largest trends in the gay community is to never get a license or feel the need to drive. As we said, much research is ongoing to find the exact scope of this trend and to find potential solutions. 
while there are many challenges we must address in the coming years from both external sources and internal ones, we have had many accomplishments this past year too. One of the many has been the amount of representation we've had in the media this past year. TV shows across all networks have incorporated more LGBTQ characters into their programs. This year saw the start to shows like Council of Dads on NBC, Get Even on BBC, and this year's unexpected smash hit on Netflix, Tiger King. When it comes to the silver screen, the world had to watch many new movies at home instead of in a theater, but that didn't stop countless LGBTQ characters and storylines from making their way into this year's films. Just to name a few, Wildland premiered in Denmark, showing people how tough and normal LGBTQ people are. Rurangi came out in New Zealand, which follows a trans man as he comes back home years after running away from his family. Little Girl premiered in France, which is a film all about a transgender girl growing up as her parents accept her gender identity. I Am Samuel came out in Kenya, which was a documentary about a man who moves to a new city in search of a new life in the homophobic country and soon falls in love with a man named Alex. And Welcome to Chechnya premiered in the United States, which was a documentary centered on the anti-gay purges in Chechnya in the late 2010s and is a wonderful film if you want to learn some recent history. In music, LGBTQ artists made their voices heard. From Rina Sawayama in Japan, Sam Smith and Grayson Chance in America, and my personal favorite, Troy Sivan in Australia, and more. But this past year, a song called You Need to Calm Down by Taylor Swift, who is a proud ally of our community, became a major anthem of the year for the LGBTQ following its 2019 release. While anti-LGBTQ groups like One Million Moms won't be happy about the representation our community has received this year, they are still 900,000 followers shy of One Million Moms, so the estimated 780 million LGBTQ people vastly outnumber them. But this past year, the biggest representation our community has gotten has actually been in children's television shows. This year, Nickelodeon officially announced SpongeBob and Patrick from their hit show, SpongeBob at SquarePants, are a gay couple. PBS made headlines when their hit children's show, Arthur, premiered an episode in which Arthur's teacher, Mr. Ratburn, got married to another man. The creator of Sesame Street officially announced that Bert and Ernie were written as a gay couple. For Pride Month this year, the show also featured kids with same-sex parents. The show's spin-off, The Not So Late Show with Elmo, interviewed people in the LGBTQ community. On Steven Universe, they featured a non-binary wedding, and Disney replayed their episodes of Good Luck Charlie, which featured a same-sex lesbian couple with a child, and Andy Mack, which was an entire show centered around the main character coming out on the show and developing a relationship with another boy his same age. Our community has had numerous major wins this past year, and it is important for us not to lose sight of those accomplishments. I know sometimes we see the headlines of a news story and it immediately makes us want to cry. We have many challenges we must overcome, but we must never forget that we are facing them together as a community. As an activist, I know how difficult it can be to feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. I know that it feels like the progress we are making is far too slow, but we must never lose our infinite hope. In the face of hatred, our hope gives us light. In the face of internal issues, our hope will bring us solutions. And in the face of anger, our infinite hope will show us how to love and return. We must stay strong for the members of our community who fall down. And when we fall down ourselves, we cannot be afraid to reach out our hand for help to get back up. Every day, I see the harmful effects hatred has on our community. Almost every day, someone comments on one of our channels asking for help, and what they tell us will be the last hours or moments of their lives. But this year, we have saved so many from the unthinkable, and in return, their infinite hope is what keeps me from the unthinkable too. No matter where you are, 
no matter your gender or your sexual orientation, you are not alone, I promise you. Our community is made up of hundreds of millions of people worldwide, and we will fight every one of these challenges together. Most importantly, we will fight to keep you by our side in the face of whatever it is you're struggling through. We will hold your hand through it all with our infinite hope. If you or someone you know is thinking of the unthinkable and needs someone to talk to, I want to end tonight by reminding you to call the Trevor Project Crisis Intervention Hotline for LGBTQ people. Their number is 1-866-488-7386. If you live in a homophobic or transphobic home, if you live outside of the United States, or if you feel like talking on the phone would be too scary, please go online to trevorchat.org so you can chat online with a trained counselor now. Those links and that phone number will be down below in the description as well. All conversations are confidential, and there is no cost in talking to someone. Again, their number is 1-866-488-7386. To all of my fellow LGBTQ members, we have many challenges to overcome. We will overcome all of them together. What makes our community unbreakable is our infinite hope. I hope this night has started the conversation so that we can overcome them. I hope that together we can help all of our community members who are trying to find the courage today to come out and say those words in the mirror to themselves or to others for the first time. Most importantly, I hope no matter what happens in the coming year, we will stand with a united front because the state of our LGBTQ union is stronger than it has ever been before. And because I love my tribe in the LGBTQ community, I would like to end tonight by saying, pause out for pups. I am Professor Pride. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a gay day, everyone, and good night. Powered by Rainbows Season 3, only on MHP-TV.